Most of the times when I when I go down, I like to check holes for grouper and other fish that like to hide in them. It's probably not that much of a mystery that Robbie and I live on a pretty tight budget here on our sailboat. There are two things that allow this sailing journey to happen. First factor is the support from viewers, awesome people who think that it's worthwhile to help fund our travel videos. Second factor is thanks for all the fish. Without a freezer or access to many other forms of protein out here, we have to go out and find our own food. How else would we be able to keep our beautiful and shapely physiques? We've been pretty happy here in the warm Mexican waters being able to take control of what we catch and eat. Personally, I used to be happy just fueling myself with one or two bricks of tofu daily but there's not much tofu around here. Before leaving, we filled our stores with as many non-perishables as possible, and the rest has been everything that we've caught. We wanted to avoid any possible hurricanes, so we made our way north. Luckily, the hurricanes have remained way offshore. We found ourselves in Isla San Francisco. Diving to check the anchor is always a fun pastime. We found a bunch of inhabitants foraging through the churned up sand. We also thought that we had found a free stainless steel mug. But it ends up that it was already taken. After several moments of deliberation, we decided to put him back. If anybody comes by this mug again, there's a little octopus inside. It wasn't long before Robinson was out catching us some dinner. Then suddenly these sea lions came out of nowhere while we were fishing and scared the poo out of me. But they were cool. Like always, we drag the dinghy around and throw our catch inside. Dragging it around is sort of a pain, but it's worth it. Anyone speeding by can see that we're in the water, and it keeps the fish from bleeding and flopping to attract other predators. father around the age of, I don't know, maybe 10 or 11, like, of, like properly taught us how to spearfish, like put weights on us and showed us how to load the gun. That, that was the beginning of my spearfishing. And yeah, I've always, kind of always been spearfishing since, since I was a very young person. Fishing here in Mexico is uh, pretty good. The spearfishing is actually better than I expected. There's a lot of edible fish. Uh, it's challenging. There are some species of fish which uh, are pretty aware of what's going on and they don't get close, like the groupers and some snappers really keep their distance. Uh, the trolling hasn't been as good as I expected. Uh, it was much better in southern Mexico between Cabo and Los Muertos. We've been mostly eating grunts. They're abundant around here. There's uh, three or four species which you can find. Uh, and there's the gray stripes. There are these ones. They're all gray. Uh, there's the brown ones with the with black head. And there's the all black ones. They're, they're pretty, fairly abundant. It's a fairly nice white meat. Uh, that's what I've been mostly trying to get. These guys can be fairly sneaky. The groupers are, abund are more abundant than I, I have expected in Mexico. There's like about three species I've noticed uh, commonly around. And uh, they're bigger and more abundant than I expected. But they, I don't know if they're just a generally cautious fish or they know what spear fishing is and they will not get anywhere near you. <laughs> they will keep that 20 feet distance if they can and 
and then sometimes they go they go in a hole and then you need a torchlight to see inside because most of all they go in a super dark so I'm gonna be attacked by something. Its arm is small? Yeah, it's car, yeah, it's like Nemo. Pomfret fillets. In the galley, we have our most distinguished spice, curry powder, the base spice of many meals. Onions and garlic last well despite the heat, as long as they are hanging and well ventilated. Most places where food can be purchased will have chili-based sauces or spice mixes. This one has a hint of lime in it. And of course, the solar cooker works well for keeping the galley cool and utilizing the free, blazing heat of the sun. Like most visitors to this place, we walk to the top of the hill. Little Rosa anchored among a growing crowd of super yachts with their endless array of marine toys. The view at the top showed us the place that we had just come from, as well as the route that we'd be traveling ahead. Apparently there was a little bit of gold mining here in the past. Robbie checked the path thoroughly making sure that miners didn't miss anything. With the yachts all around us just bursting with music, jet skis, and wakeboards, we thought we were nearly invisible, until we received an invitation to a fiesta from our neighbor. Calix was the biggest yacht currently anchored in the bay. Her hosts and crew had pretty big hearts as well. They invited us up for drinks, snacks, and a ride on the water slide. That's extremely vertical, a little more vertical than I thought when it was described to me. I made it halfway up the climbing wall before jumping off and taking the stairs back up to the party. We were sliding the night away. <laughs> Now it's got some meat. Before you go swimming, mm -hmm. before you go sliding. We filled up on ice and water from the super yacht and jumped over to Isla Coyote, Mangroves, and Isla Cayo. Actually, we found out when we arrived that spearfishing wasn't allowed there. But we investigated the fish situation anyways. Our next stop, and our rest point for the night, was the mangrove on Isla San Jose, also a protected marine area. We anchored close to the shore because of our rowing dinghy. However, we experienced an attack of no during the night. One side of the mangrove channel was deeper than the other. Small young fish hung out on the shallow side, and then the bigger grown fish settled on the deeper side. Exiting the mangrove, we went straight to work with the fishing rods to catch some lunch. At Isla Cayo, the water wasn't the clearest thing ever, but we spotted a sea turtle and chased down some more food for the day. In 
San Evaristo, we hoped to find some Wi-Fi, but the town was super quiet. We spoke to some local fishermen, and they said that they go to Isla San Diego for their catch. So that's where we were heading to. We still haven't shaken that reef out of our mainsail. Finding the setup to be a little more balanced with the comparably smaller jib. We made it to Isla San Diego with varying winds throughout the day and looked upon the tiny island with the familiar cactus coating. Another beautiful sunset on the Sea of Cortez, and we were eager to get into the water the next day. Not far from our boat, there were a fair amount of pompano and grunts in the water. Pompano are what Robbie calls these beautiful little fish with long, elegant fins. Even at point-blank range, they're fast enough to sometimes get away. And sometimes not. Either way, he reloaded the gun and got one more. These particular reef fish are often the first ones I see when I get into the water. They're feisty and they'll try to nibble at anything. Swimming to the northern tip of the island, we began to see more and more fish overall. And the current grew stronger as well. We left Isla San Diego accompanied by large grey dolphins. They're huge! And made our course towards Agua Verde. I hope you enjoyed viewing a little bit of what life is like out here in the Sea of Cortez. Hope to see you next time. Thank you to all our supporters and don't forget to like, subscribe, you can leave a tip or become a patron. All in the links below this video.